I came ready to preach this morning. Sarah, you're ready for it. I'm so thankful that church, Christianity, this thing we call faith, does not end on Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is just a, just a chance to gather everybody together and celebrate again and celebrate again. But I know that God not only wants to rescue you from your past and give you new life, but man, to give you new confidence, new vision, new inspiration, to be the person that you only could dream that you would be. And so we're, we're going to look this morning in, in, in the Bible. If you got your Bibles with you, which I hope you do, Luke Chapter 22 will be our first book, and then we're going to go to John chapter 21. And, and as you're flipping there, uh, the title of this morning's message is, Let's Go. So turn to your neighbor and say, Let's Go. And half of y'all are wondering, where are we going? You'll find out. Don't worry. But you already invited them. Thank you for doing that. In, in the book of Matthew, which is not where we're going to be this morning, but in the book of Matthew, there's this account of what Jesus talks about after he resurrects from the dead. That was last week, Resurrection Sunday. And then he grabs his crew and he starts to talk to them and he says, y'all need to go. Like, like let's go. We, we, we got things to do. Because the, the grave and the resurrection was just the beginning. Because there's people that are outside these walls right now that need the hope and love that only Jesus can give. And so I would say to you, let's go. There are marriages that are literally broken. And the Holy Spirit needs to come in and the church needs to gather around them instead of throwing stones, need to give grace, and I would say, let's go. There are people that are strung out on drugs. I'm not talking like smoked a joint one time. I'm talking like their life is jacked up because of it. They're embarrassed by it. They're in bondage by it. And God wants to set them free, but nobody's telling them. And so I would say for people like me and you, let's go. Maybe y'all aren't ready to go. I'll, I'll just go. All right. Luke chapter 22. There's this guy named Peter. And in order for us to see where Peter's going to go, we got to look at where Peter once was. Because how many of y'all know your story of who you were is a part now of who you are and still is a part of who you're becoming, right? You can't erase the past. It's there unless you got a time machine or you got some sort of special car that you can go back to the future in, right? There's no way to go back and change it. So who you have been affects who you are now and affects who you're going to become. So we got to look at Peter and where he was. And if you if you know anything about Peter, he was, a, he was kind of a rough and tough guy. He was, a, he was a sailor. He was a fisherman. And when they say cuss is like a sailor, like I would think that Peter would have fit that build right there. Peter was a pretty rough dude. And Jesus said, drop your nets. I know you're fishing right now, but come on with me. You're going to be fishers of men. And so Peter goes, let's go. And he decides to abandon everything to go after whatever Jesus says. That's a pretty big move to do. And so Peter's walking with them. He's hanging with them. He's doing things, and people are getting healed, and all sorts of crazy stuff's happening. He's like, I don't know what's exactly taking place, but it's Jesus, so I'm going to go with it. And then things start to heat up, and we're going to pick up right before the crucifixion happens. And so in Luke chapter 22... In some verse. What verse is it? 31. Is that right? 32? There it is on the screen. Or is it 33? All right, we'll start at 33. That's right. Peter said to him, Peter's talking to Jesus right now. Lord, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Peter is all in right now. Like there, there's no doubt that Peter, I mean, he's, he's, he's willing to say, I'll go to prison and I'll even die for what you're doing. Have you ever had an all-in moment? Like where, you, where you're so convinced, I'm glad you have Victor. I'm, you ever had a moment where you're like, I would literally die for this. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's a business, whether it's a, a dream, whatever it is, like it's something that you're so stinking passionate about, you would do anything to see it come to fruition. And, and that's where Peter, Peter, he is sold out right now. 
Like he, he is ready to do whatever it takes to follow Jesus. So he says, I'll go to prison. I'll even die for it. And then Jesus comes back with a very peculiar statement. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. Jesus says, I know you say you're all in right now, Peter, but guess what? There's going to come a time very, very soon where you're going to say that you didn't even know me. And Peter, being Peter, he's like, yeah, whatever, Jesus. I love you. We're, we're good. That would never, ever happen. You ever said something would never happen? Ugh, that's the worst. Then you got to eat it afterwards when it does happen. So Peter says that would never, ever, ever happen. And if we go a couple verses forward in that chapter 2, verse 54, we see the account of when it does happen. Then they seized him. That's Jesus. And they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. Side sermon for a moment. The moment that you distance yourself from the move of God, you're in trouble. I've never seen anybody that was like, I'm just going to cling to Jesus and cling to the church and cling to other believers and cling to my Bible who found themselves going down a bad path. What happens is when you create separation between you and what God's doing, that is a recipe and a setup for disaster in your life. And so Jesus was hanging out, hanging out, hanging out, and now he's creating separation. He's creating distance. He's, he's a little bit afraid. This is the guy that said, I'll never, ever leave you, Jesus. I'll go to prison. I'll die for you. So he creates this separation. He follows them at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them, some other people. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, so she's kind of checking him out across the fire. Like, that guy looks a little bit familiar. And goes, this man was also with him. She's sure of it. And Peter... Bold Peter, all in Peter, let's go Peter, denied it, said, woman, I don't know him. So a little later, someone else said, you're, you're also one of them. And Peter said, man, I'm not. That's two, in case you struggle to count, that's twice, one, two. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted saying, certainly, this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Oh, and it was like time stood still in that moment. It's like everything just stopped. And, and Peter was close enough to Jesus not to talk to him, but they could still see each other. It was like he was just across the courtyard. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine that moment of Jesus looking at you and, happen, and what he said would happen is exactly what happens. And so he looks at him and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. And it's easy for us to say, we'd never be like that. Like, obviously, we're, we're all in when it comes to church. We only come once a month, but we're all in. Just kidding, just kidding. All the people that come every week laughed at that one. Everybody else is like, oh. A lot of, we, we would say, we're not going to be like that. I mean, I love Jesus. He saved my soul. I'd never ever be that person that would deny him three times in a row. The Bible says if you deny Jesus here on earth, the Father will deny you in heaven. That would never take place for people like us, right? Or maybe it would. Maybe I'm Peter. And maybe in many ways you're Peter. That although you've said you're all in, Although you've said, God, whatever it takes, I'm willing to, to follow you with every bit of my life. Maybe you've gotten to that spot where at one point you were the let's go kind of person, and now you're the, 
I don't even have a word for it. Just nah. like you know, where you're, where you're, where you're not dying, but you're not thriving either. You're somewhere in the middle. And I, and I would say, if that's you, if you, if you have bigger dreams than where you're at right now, if if you, if you know that God can do more in and through you than what you're seeing manifest today, you are in the perfect spot for God to use you like he uses Peter. And so let's look at the second half of the story. So, so up until now, what's taken place is Peter was fishing. Jesus said, let's go. Peter said, let's go. And then he denied him three times in a row. He, he's, he's, the, he's the perfect hypocrite. He would be perfect for this church. It'd be wonderful. We could have Peters all over the place. So that, that's who Peter has been. But look at who Peter's going to become. If we go to John chapter 21, flip forward. Nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. There we are. So Peter has gone back to his old life. Any of y'all have a an old life? One you wish you didn't go. That's why I don't go to my high school reunions. I don't want nobody to bring up all the stuff that took place. It was before Facebook. Thank you, Jesus. There's no documentation. I don't need to go back. I don't need to relive that. Peter starts to go back to the life he used. My wife's laughing right now because she knows. Peter's going back to his old life. He ran with Jesus for three years. It was, it was really, really good, but now he's found himself back on the very boat that he used to fish on. He goes back to the boat, and he's doing, he's actually a pretty crappy fisherman on that day. He's caught nothing all night. Pulled an all-nighter, trying to do his old job, nothing. And Jesus shows up, and Jesus gives him some tips. He's like, hey, Peter, Try fishing over there. I think they catch 156 fish. You can check. It says it in there. And really good day of fishing now that Jesus has shown up. And Jesus says, come on, let's cook some breakfast. And so in, in John chapter 21, starting in verse 15, it says, when they had finished breakfast, and I'm thinking that's got to be an awkward breakfast. You ever had one of those meals where like there's just tension that's not being said at the table? Like something happened in the past and no one's talking about it and the tension's so thick you could just slice it? Like it's probably one of those breakfasts where, where there's, there's things have happened and it's just, it's tough. And so Jesus breaks the ice. And Jesus turns to Peter in verse 15 and when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And it's interesting what Jesus says right there. So the guy's name is Simon Peter. And he doesn't just call him Simon or Peter. He says, Simon, son of John. Because Jesus knew his background. Jesus knew where he came from. He knew what he did. He knew what he traded in. He knew the success. And then he saw the failure again. He's seen the whole gamut of things. So he says, Peter, I know who you are. I know what you used to do, and I know what you did last. But my question for you, Simon Peter, is do you love me more than all these other things? And Simon Peter replies back, and says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16. Said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, again, just reemphasizing, Peter, I know who you are. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Said to him, tend my sheep. And then in verse 17, he said to him a third time, third time, Third time, third, third time. What else happened three times? Denied him three times. That's exactly it. So in this moment right now, Jesus is about to speak, and, and Peter's world is about to collide. He says to him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. And how true is that? Like there's some things that your friends know and there's some things your friends don't know. You don't need to spell it out right now. There's some things your spouse knows 
There's some things your spouse may not know. Any, any teenagers in here, there's some things your parents know, and they probably know more than you think they do. Thank you, Lord, for internet tracking. Find my iPhone, stalk those children in Jesus' name. There's some things that your parents know, but there's some things that your parents don't know. But here we see that he knows, he knows everything. He knows everything. Lord, you know everything. All the stuff from the past, God, you know it. All the stuff that, that I wish no one knew, God, you know every single thing that's ever happened in my life, good, bad, and different. God, you know it. Lord, you know everything. And you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And Peter, in that moment, came face to face with a past he wished he never had. Because round one was, Peter, stop fishing. Come on, be fishers of men. Jesus says, let's go. Peter says, let's go. And then he denies him. Not once, not twice, but three times. The second time this takes place. Oh, this, is, this is good right here. Peter is in a boat. Jesus says, be, be fisher of men. Let's go. And Peter says, All right, let's go. And then God three times in a row says, P Peter, do you love me? He says, yes. He goes, good. Get in the game. Let's go. P Peter, do you love me? Well, yes. Uh, of course, Lord. Good. Get in the game. Let's go. And then a third time he asks him, P Peter, do you love me? And a third time he says, yes, let's go. There's a church to lead. There's things to take place. God, I know you're not finished with me yet. And Peter goes on to become the first leader in the early church. The guy who couldn't stand up for him at one point, man, now he's the one who God's using in a way bigger than he ever thought possible. And so I'm going to ask the, the worship team to go ahead and come on up right now. You all have done this, right? You see, in life, there's pressure. And like you think things are going well, and then all of a sudden things get out of hand a little bit. And I mean, you, you, can, you can feel, there, there's, there's pressure in here right now. There, there's pressure. I could have opened it and shot you in the face. Don't sue the church. There's pressure in church. There's pressure in life. There's pressure in work. There's pressure in home. And as that pressure happens, you can find yourself denying once, denying twice, denying three times. And then maybe you get another chance and pressure and pressure and pressure. And there's pressure at home. There's pressure at work. There's pressure in church. There's pressure with your friends. There's, there's pressure all over the place. And the problem isn't the pressure. The problem is what you've been filled with. Because if you've been filled with the old you, that's going to be a mess. And when the pressure rises and you're faced with that moment, it's not going to happen once, it's not going to happen twice, but three times in a row, you're going to find yourself creating a mess because of the pressure. But if you let God fill you, Come on, you're with me right now. If you let God fill you, the same vessel filled with a different substance creates a different result. And that's good, and somebody better make some noise for that. That's good preaching right there. So my question for you is, what are you filled with? Are you Peter round one? Because round one, Peter was all about himself. I'm good. I got this. I'm Peter. 
I can tackle a boat, I can tackle a fish, I can tackle a mountain. I don't know if he said that, but I'm thinking he might have. He's, he's, he's all about himself. I got this. But then he doesn't. And I'm sure you've been there too. But Peter round two had been completely emptied. Completely emptied. All that sugary mess and cancer cause them, whatever. This one doesn't even have any caffeine. It's worthless. When all that stuff gets emptied out, you create an opportunity for God to fill you with something. And what once could have been an explosion now is the most life-giving thing in the world. I think there's some of you in here this morning and you think you've been disqualified because of your past. You think you'll never ever be able to measure up because of that thing. And I don't know what it is, the person next to you doesn't know what it is, but I would say that every single person in here is thinking about something in their own mind. Welcome to the club, I'm with you. The things of your past do not define what the potential of your future is. If, if Peter would have bought into that, Peter would have always been the person who watched from a distance as Jesus was arrested, who watched from a distance as he was on trial, who watched from a distance as he was beaten, who ran off and cried while the crucifixion was taking place. He would have always been that distant person if his past defined him. But man, God gave him a new heart. God filled him up with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the next time Peter opens up his mouth, he preaches and 3,000 people get saved. Your past does not disqualify you. Some others of you in here, you, you've, you've been doing some good things. There, there's nothing wrong with fishing. I, I love to fish. As long as the fish are biting. Even if the fish aren't biting, it's still fun. There's nothing wrong with grinding at your job. There's nothing wrong with trying to provide for your family. There's nothing wrong with trying to, to build things up. There's, there's nothing wrong with that unless you can't answer Jesus' first question. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? For some of you, it's not that you feel disqualified. It's that you love the these more than God himself. And I think God wants to reprioritize some things in your life, to shift some things in your life this morning. And for you to say, God, you really are the most important thing. And so if we could, we could stand across this room. Last Sunday of April, first Sunday after Resurrection Sunday, we're going to go big right now. And when I say big, I'm not talking about sweet bass licks, although if you do, I'd be happy. I'm talking about big moves of faith right now. There's some of you in here and you feel like your past has disqualified you and you need a new beginning, a fresh start. And if that's you, I want you to come on down to this altar. Not even going to count to three. Just come on, wherever you are. There's others of you. And don't worry, you can be the first one. More will come. There's others of you. It's not so much your past. It's that you're choosing the wrong things. They're not bad things, but you've created idols. It says it in the Bible, let there be no idols, no false gods before me. You've put things before Jesus. And you're not following them the way you need to. And you need to start a pattern right now. Saying, God, you're my priority. I forsake those things in the name of you. And if that's you, again, slip out from your seat. Come on forward right now. And we're going to end this service worshiping just saying thank you God that you 
are a miracle worker, that you can use me in ways that I never thought possible, that if you can use a Peter, you can use me. If you can use a Michael, Lord have mercy, you can use me. That if you would open yourself up, then God will do some great things in your life. And so as the worship team prays, there's already people down here. No one's going to get your information. We just want you to make a physical step saying, God, something spiritual is taking place in my life. Come on forward right now.